Uh, born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, lived in LaGrange in the Oldham County parts for a few years with my mother and we moved in with my dad in Louisville and that's where I finished growing up and graduated Eastern High School. My grandfather, um, he was in the Navy from 49 to 53 during the Korean conflict. Uh, he was an electrician's mate on a few different ships, uh, mainly destroyers. But um, honestly, I always had a thing for airplanes and flight deck. And I grew up during the Top Gun era, you know, late 80s, early 90s, and always thought it was so cool, the Tomcats and whatnot. And I always told myself if I was going to join the military, it'd be the Navy just to do that. But uh, when my grandfather passed in 2004, and I wasn't doing that great at college in the University of Louisville. I felt I really didn't have any direction in life. I joined the Navy. I met up with my recruiter. Of course, I had to lose weight, but it really wasn't that hard. Um, I it, got good scores on the ASVAB, didn't have really any problems getting in. Um, but when it came down to MEPS, I told them what I wanted to do. And I told them I wanted to be an aircraft engine mechanic. And if they cannot get me that job, I'm not signing. So uh, they were able to get me the job. I would just have to wait six months before they could put me in. Originally, when I went to MEPS, that was when I signed the contract and got the job. Uh, I waited six months. And then the second time when I went to MEPS to actually process in, I went straight from MEPS to Great Lakes, Chicago for uh, recruit training command. Why the long wait? Uh, they didn't need aircraft mechanics as much as they needed soldiers and Marines. Yeah. One of my collateral duties was as a plane captain. I was in charge of the overall inspection and safety of the aircraft. And this is a $51 million airplane. Not to mention it's got an air crew of five people. One wrong mistake on my part could cost the lives and the government a lot of money. There's a lot of uh, inoculations as far as medical screening, dental screening, and this is when they find out whether or not they need to pull your wisdom teeth. And I'd say about a good quarter of my division, including myself, needed our wisdom teeth pulled. And so wait, the Navy pulls your wisdom teeth? Yes. It's mandatory. Mandatory. If, if they look like they're not going to grow in right, they will pull them without even you know, asking, do you want them pulled? They will just say, they gotta go. So, um, <laughs> my advice for anybody who's considering the Navy and wants to get them pulled, you can either get them done in boot camp for free, but with a lot of pain, because they only, they, they don't want to just have drugs floating out there. They only give you a very limited amount of pain meds, and they don't even knock you out. I hear a lot of college students, you know, getting knocked out for their wisdom teeth pulled and they get a whole bag full of drugs. So, but a free wisdom teeth pull. <laughs> and then flew to Norfolk and did my A school. That's where they sent all of the aviation mechanics and all that whatnot to there to learn the basics of the job, how an aircraft engine works and how to check the Naval Aviation Maintenance Procedures, manuals, and all that. But as soon as I graduated A school, which was five weeks later, they sent me to C school, which is more career school, and it's, it becomes more aircraft specific. And they show you how to pull an aircraft engine, they tell you how to pull the propeller and change oil filters and all different kinds of things. And that was another five weeks. And then upon graduating C school, I was able to take two weeks of leave and then come back and check into my command. The first day was pretty fun. I got to meet a whole bunch of people. Um, I met a guy that was actually, he's actually from Kentucky, Western Kentucky, and uh, we bonded pretty well. Uh, I got to learn a little bit more about the aircraft and different stuff, but you're not gonna learn everything in one day. 
that plane is very, very complicated. So um, I'd say over the process of six months, I learned what I needed to learn to do what I was going to be doing. So the first few years, um, I'd say the first year and a half, all I did was, you know, do the whole go to work, come home type of thing. We never really deployed. We were previously attached to the George Washington and it hadn't deployed in a very long time. It was actually in the yards, the shipyards. So our squadron had come quite um, not so busy. All we were doing was, you know, land flights and nothing really had in, nothing to do with the ship for the first few years that I was in. Really wasn't worried about deployment um, until like later into my career. We, we did other things before actually deploying. Uh, my first time actually setting foot on a carrier was in September 2007. So I'd been in the Navy for about a year and a half, a little bit longer before I actually did what you know my calling was. And we went out to sea for nine days and did a little qualification on the George Washington because the George Washington had been in the shipyard so long, they had to make sure the flight deck is ready to get ready and go out. And, you know, we did the, the whole nine days and um, we got the order that the George Washington was going to be replacing the USS Kitty Hawk in Japan. So we started training and much like the Army, how they do their drills, we actually go out to sea and do our training. So we have to be away from home and um, you're literally out to sea for a month and you're doing back-to-back -back general quarters drills. You're doing um, fire drills. We're doing all kinds of different stuff and it's very, very tiresome. You actually wish you were deployed. I personally like deploying better than I do training missions because you actually get to rest. Um, but we did about, we did two training missions, two months of training before we actually set out to sea to leave the country. It was my first time ever leaving the country, period. We went uh, out to sea in April of 2008. Uh, we left the port of Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, the mission was to go around South America and come up to uh, San Diego, California to drop the ship off and have them send on their way a few months later to Japan. Um, so, you know, I, I've had plenty of flight deck experience and I've trained many others in my footsteps on how to survive on the flight deck, not get killed, and how things work up there. Well, at first I was attached to the line division. And if you know anything about aircraft maintenance, you, you have the line division or the plane captains, and they're kind of like the grunt job that nobody wants to do. And it's cleaning the airplane inspecting it, putting grease in all the lubrication points. Uh, but the glamorous part of being a plane captain is actually standing in front of the plane when the pilots are in there and telling them to turn on the engines and checking lights and whatnot. Um, that's the day in the life of a, of a person in the line division. But I didn't actually work on the flight deck as an aircraft mechanic until my OEF deployment. and. That consists of doing engine inspections, um, checking inside the engine panels for foreign object debris, uh, looking for oil spills, hydraulic fluid leaks, uh, watching the plane, if you've seen on Top Gun, where they put their, their fingers up and say it's good to go. And that's a mechanic's you know, job, is to make sure the plane is ready to go before they actually shoot it off the deck with a catapult. We were taking the George Washington down from Norfolk, Virginia, around South America. all around South America. We stopped at two places. Uh, we stopped in Rio de Janeiro uh, in 
I want to say mid-April or so. Um, it, was, it was pretty cool. It's a very impoverished city. Never ever seen people sleeping on cardboard boxes. I know my friends and I were walking one of the strips and we had a 12 year old girl carrying an infant and she had her hand out asking for money. And we didn't speak Portuguese, nor did really we really have any cash. So it was pretty sad this 12 year old girl was following us for two to three blocks, just begging and we couldn't help her. So um, the whole place, it was just trashed. Um, I know I was reading somewhere that Ipanema Beach and Coco Cabana it was one of the best beaches in the world, but honestly, it had a bunch of trash, and, and it just it wasn't really what I expected it to be. But the the city of Rio really isn't that bad. It's just you got to look past all that. Honestly, when it came to the time we stopped in Rio, we had to anchor out. I don't know, maybe half a mile, a mile out, off the coast, and you have to. The Navy will subcontract out um, little small boats and they will load us up. Uh, we'll, we'll go to the fantail of the ship and walk off and actually get on these boats and they bring us to shore. Sometimes if you're lucky you can get to a port where you're able to just anchor and you're able to moor in straight to the pier, but an aircraft carrier can sometimes be hard to do that with. The next one was in Chile. Um, well, before we went there, you know, we pulled out from Brazil, and the week after we pulled away from uh, Rio, we had the Brazilian, I can't remember if it was their Air Force or their Navy. Our planes were flying with them, and they were just playing tag, I guess. Some kind of show of force, you know, to, what was it called? Uh, air power demonstrations. And we had a lot of oil companies and whatnot. It was kind of shady come to our flight deck and watch the what our planes can do and all this stuff. But um, after they left, we started going down, down south. And um, what was really cool was uh, we trekked through the Straits of Magellan. And we were told to stock up on Dremamine. Are you familiar with Dremamine? Motion it's a mo motion sickness pill. Uh, but honestly, it really wasn't that bad. When we went through Straits of Magellan, the, the reason why the Straits of Magellan is supposed to be so rocky for sea is because it's where the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans meet, and there's supposed to be a really strong current. Now, granted, it was extremely cold because you're pretty close to the South Pole, and um, but it was definitely a sight to see uh, going through there because it's just a small, you know, body of water going between two land masses. It's it pretty a very scenic trek through the water there. But yeah, once we got out of the Straits of Magellan, uh, we went up to Chile, Valparaiso, Chile is where we stopped. And it was a, a pretty good port. Uh, they spoke Spanish there obviously and their, their money system was a little easier. Uh, they took pesos and we had some Spanish speaking people, so they, they knew how to communicate versus Brazil where they speak Portuguese. Um, but it was, it was all, in, all in all good town. Uh, one weird part was, uh, you know, when, just like Brazil and Chile, we had to anchor out and uh, we had some pretty bad weather the last day we were in port in Chile. And it, uh, we usually get barges that attach to the fantail of the ship so that we can walk on to the other boat. And the weather was so bad, it ripped the barge off. We lost the barge and there was no way for us to get back uh, to the ship. So a lot of us, when we were out in town that night, we ended up having to sleep um, in charter buses, waiting until the next morning where they would uh, attach a new barge and let us get back onto the ship. It's like living on a floating city. There are places where you take your trash, 
there's a whole floor dedicated to food, you know, the forward and the aft galleys, and um, depending on what you want to eat that day, you go to that corresponding galley. Um, there's a, a store on the ship. There is a library, um, all different kinds of shops. And like I said, it's, it's a floating city. It's got a gym in it. Um, you got the hangar bay for, you know, you can go down to the hangar bay and watch outside the ship, like watch the water and whatnot. So it's, it's rather large. <laughs> so what did you do in your spare time? Sleep. <laughs> uh, I mean, there were some times where I, you know, would go to the gym for a few hours after I was done with work. But other than that, I mean, you're working 12 hours a day on the flight deck, just sweating. And the only real place for you to go is you know, either the gym or bed because your only place that you belong to is your work center. And if you don't leave the work center because they're so crowded, if you don't leave the work center within a certain amount of time when you're off shift, then they put you to work. So it's your best bet if you don't want to be overworked, you want to leave the work center. Major segregation between the enlisted and the officers uh, in the Navy. Uh, I've talked with other veterans that have been in the Marines and the Army, and they'll talk about how, you know, their division officer would come and eat lunch with them where they're at the mess hall and whatnot. And I told Matt in the Navy, that's unheard of. The Navy, you have designated places for the officers to sleep, designated places for the officers to eat, and even designated places for the officers to go to the bathroom. So <laughs> on the ship, it'll say on the door, officer head only. And if it didn't have any type of designation of what kind of head it is, then it's for enlisted and anybody can use it and trash it up, honestly. So um, there's a huge segregation between enlisted and officer. Are officers, do they clean their own bathrooms? No. We sailed up uh, past the uh, South Americas and we're about off uh, 200 miles off the coast of the Galapagos Islands. And I was working the day shift at the time. Uh, so the shift is like, you have to be there at six o'clock in the morning for a six o'clock, six thirty maintenance meeting or something like that. And I remember hearing over the one, one MC, you know, calling fire away. Uh, no big deal. That stuff happens all the time. Uh, someone's got this little fire that they can't take care of and they end up calling fire party in. But, um, in our shop, our specific little room, we get more communications than just the one MC, the general overhead. And we're hearing radios go off like, we're gonna have to uh, call general quarters for this and, and all of that. Uh, so they call general quarters and it wakes everybody else up that was coming off the night shift. And uh, apparently there was a, a pretty big fire on the seventh deck and it was at uh, frame 180, which is towards the end of the ship, the, the, the back end. And uh, basically everybody on the ship was fighting this fire. I did a little bit on the flight deck and whatnot, but we weren't fully trained to do the, you know, the deep shipboard firefighting. And it was from about 6.30 in the morning till about 6.30 at night, something like that, uh, is that fire we were in general quarters from that fire. Um, they ended up having to shut the power off on the whole end of the ship from 180 back. Uh, they had to shut the power off. So now ironically, that's where our living compartments were. So everything we did in our living compartment was in the dark, no AC, uh, no hot water. So we had to take uh, Superman showers and uh, <laughs> so, long story short, we hightailed it to San Diego. We were planning on flying a few missions off the coast of uh, Galapagos, and but you know, with that setback, we uh, we needed to get to San Diego quick. San, San Diego is a beautiful city, wonderful port, 
but that's when they also sent the investigators in onto the ship when we pulled in and they said about 50 million dollars worth of damage um, after a little bit of investigation they found that uh, someone had been smoking a cigarette on the seventh deck in a compartment that happened to have Freon in it and I guess they ditched the butt you know thinking they were gonna get caught by somebody and it started a fire with the hazmat so we weren't sure what was next well we found out when we got back that we were going to join with the USS Eisenhower and the Eisenhower if anybody knows anything about that is the surge carrier of the Navy and they do back to back to back deployments and their deployment schedule was looking like six months on six months off and then seven months on and then a year off something like that and I knew this was going to be the tail end of my career I was already in for you know two and a half years or so when this was going on and I knew I was going to catch at least one of these deployments uh, so as soon as we as soon as we got back to Virginia we immediately started training uh, we did our pilot desert training in Nevada uh, it gives the pilots a chance to fly in a desert to get used to flying in Afghanistan and uh, then we started doing our shipboard training again just like we did on the Washington uh, and then we finally pulled out for our Operation Enduring Freedom deployment and I believe late January 2009 and we were slated for uh, five to six months. After we were through with the Mediterranean we uh, went through the uh, uh, Suez Canal into I believe it's the Red Sea and that was pretty cool was to go through Suez and uh, and then ultimately a few days later we were in our area of operation flying our planes over to Afghanistan to uh, support troops on the ground. What is exactly your ship's mission at this point? <laughs> do flight ops and do them safely. Um, we had our planes flying almost every day except for Fridays. Friday I guess was the religious holiday of the inhabitants of Afghanistan and whatnot and we were flying every day from probably 7 in the morning till about 10 at night and um, just had to do it safely because whenever the troops on the ground needed an airstrike anything like that we were going to be there for them. Even though you do it every day seven days a week you know three days off a month the flight deck still has this thing about it to keep their adrenaline going because anything could happen uh, one of the most dangerous things about the flight deck is the, the aircraft that are landing. Uh, they have hooks, tail hooks on their planes, and they catch a uh, landing gear wire. And there have been a few cases where those wires have snapped, and they're about two to three inches in diameter. So anything, at, when they snap, if anything's in their way, it's going to take it out. So um, now, granted, the aviation boatswain's mates that are in charge of maintaining that gear they're pretty good about it I've never seen any type of mishap when it comes to you know faulty landing equipment or you know shooting equipment they're pretty good at it but you always knew that in the back of your head that you want to stay away from that landing gear when uh, when the airplane is landing my squadron in particular since I was an airborne early warning squadron we only had four airplanes we, I didn't work on Hornets or anything like that, and those squadrons can have anywhere between 12 to 20 air, aircraft. We only had four that our aircrafts were expensive enough. So generally we'd have about three aircraft on the flight deck, and it's actually the biggest airplane on the flight deck is the E-2C Hawkeye. But we had two of them on the deck at all times at least, sometimes three. And we've always got one down in the hangar bay doing some kind of you know, full-blown maintenance, an engine pull, new paint, uh, landing gear replacement, anything like that. So we were always working. I, did, I really did not see what, what they were driving at with their whole attention to detail in boot camp. But in the Navy, when it comes to certain, there can be a hairline crack in the 
in the uh, blade of a propeller that can instantly make the plane be in a down status. And if you don't catch that, that could be a whole part of the blade and you lose, pr you know, you lose prop thrust and the plane could crash. I, I really didn't have much complaints of what I was doing, but I knew it wasn't something I was going to do for the rest of my life. So honestly, telling myself that I'll just be moving on to another chapter when this is finished because I only had about four months left after we got back from deployment and then I was separating out. So all I had to do is just keep pushing through the deployment and then I would be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, when you're on the flight deck and you have a propeller driven aircraft, there's always, always the dangers of someone walking through the prop arc while the aircraft is turning. And um, there have been many times where I'd catch a few people, you know, walking, you know, towards the propeller and I'd have to pull them back. They actually have handles on, they call them float coats. They're like tactical life vests. If you know, They've got saltwater detectors in them. So if you fall overboard, they automatically inflate. Um, but they've got handles on the back of them, so you can grab somebody and pull them back for that exact reason. And uh, there are a few times where I'd have to do that. Uh, I've had a few trainees kind of slip up and get outside what we call the foul line. When aircraft land, you have a foul line that you cannot cross because that's where the aircraft are going to be landing. And, uh, and I've pulled a few of them out before the actual the air boss could see them crossing the foul line. So. Honestly, you know, some people argue that, you know, the Navy's a safe job and flight deck is, uh, I would possibly say that it's almost as dangerous as, you know, being a soldier on the ground in Afghanistan or Iraq. It's just that nobody's shooting at you. So, I mean, you're walking on, an, on a floating airport. Planes are constantly taking off, landing, and you're walking around in that same vicinity. Uh, I mean, hell, that's why I've got a hearing problem because I'm used to standing next to airplanes taking off. As soon as they told me how to apply for the GI Bill, that's the first thing I did when I got home from class that day is I applied for the GI Bill and I applied at EKU all in the same day. And I got my, uh, what's that paper called? The eligibility papers from the VA. And I was able to turn that in as soon as I walked in the EKU. Whereas some people, they haven't even applied for the GI Bill. They have to wait to show their uh, GI Bill status. The 2008 economy started, you know, dying. And it kind of made me wonder about aviation in general. A lot of job cuts. It's very hard to get a mechanic job in the aviation industry right now. So I figured, well, there's always going to be a need for cops. So figured to go to EKU for, they have a pretty decent criminal justice program and figured after a little while I'd pick up detective and, you know, do my career as that. But uh, after a year or so in EKU and talking with the VA between my hearing problems and my anxiety, I don't think police work is really the best for me. And uh, someone in a conference had prompted me to possibly look into law. So, and that's the direction I'm currently heading towards is uh, training to be an attorney. If it weren't for the Navy, I'd probably be stuck in Louisville with a dead end job, uh, no direction in life, most certainly would not have had the opportunity to go to college because obviously I'm here on benefits and it's absolutely wonderful. Well, I'm a senior right now, uh, a 3.4 GPA, currently taking an LSAT class and we'll be taking the LSAT in October. We will see after the score of that, when those come out, where I can actually go for law school if I can even get in. Um, I'm hoping to go to UK, U of L, NKU, something like that, and see from there. Uh, honestly, where do I want to study? Uh, or what do I want to study? I don't know. Um, 
I know I need to figure out. I, I love working with veterans, so I, I need to figure out some kind of avenue, some kind of branch that I can study that would help me better the veteran population of America. Ever since I've been at EKU, um, it's been approached by the officers of EKU vets and um, during my whole enrollment at EKU, I've been active officer, uh, now president of the organization. Um, and ever since then, it's just been much better. I believe had I've had some kind of com camaraderie at University of Louisville, I probably would have made it through. But since I was going to UofL, uh, going to school, going home, and going to work, you know, it just got monotonous, just like high school. But here, it's it's different. You know, I feel like I have a huge friendship base, and a lot of guys who are there to support me. Would you credit your military service with giving you any kind of skills and abilities that you didn't have before? Discipline. 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 Persistence, and um, don't settle for anything less. Honestly, like. Uh, when it comes to homework, you know, it's, it's easy to just throw out a gob of paper and turn it in. But if you take a look at what you've written and you say this is unacceptable and you revise it to where it's, you know, coherent, where it answers the question with a well-rounded, um, you know, set of what the professor wants, then it's easy to get an A. The way the new Navy is going right now, um, they were doing a whole lot of downsizing and they would get their hopes up by you know, trying to go in and make a career out of it. Other than that, if they're planning on just doing their four years, go for it. You know, it's, it's good experience, good uh, things you can take home from life, but I'd probably recommend Army or Marines. <laughs> EKU is a great school to go. I mean, you, you can't get any better for a place for veterans. Uh, I mean, we, we've got our own lounge to just hang out and uh, maximum opportunities for credit hours and uh, just an overall veteran friendly community. And that's really what I would take away from it.